Uh, it's still time consuming. It doesn't let me be as stubborn, and I like being stubborn sometimes. Um, I have fewer things to complain about, so what, what good is that for conversation starters? Um, and it's kind of overkill to build Ansible and script everything when some simple notes would do in a lot of cases. Um, so that's where I ended up with my solution three, which is what I, I, this is sort of my background, and then here's where I'm at, and here's what I've decided to do, and if it works for game, it does not great. Um, which is basically just versioning and documentation. Uh, the pros to this is that uh, uh, sort of a pro and a con, as you can see, is it requires learning new habits. So I still have to remember to actually document this stuff. Once I've Googled it, I can't just say, oh, well, I Googled it. I'm good. It's, it's going to last forever because that never works. Uh, it does let me be stubborn. I can still do things my way and not have to learn some silly new tool necessarily. Um, it's also quite generic. Um, regardless of, let's see, what did I say here? Regardless of uh, versions that break syntax, et cetera. Because a lot of this is just well taken and documented and versioned notes to an extent. Um, and a lot of the, the syntax that I've backed up, as you'll see, is sort of generic. Uh, I'm trying not to make, I'm trying not to just take config dumps of the whole operating system and say, Here's the config. And then when I try and restore it three versions later, it breaks because this one version is out, this one node in there is outdated. It's sort of like if you ever go to update something using apt. And it's like, hey, this config file right here has been modified by someone since we last did it. Do you want to install the package containers version or do you want to keep your version? Uh, and then you look at the diff and you're like, oh, I edited that one line and now that's a default option, so I really don't care. So I don't need to worry about putting that in config. Uh, of course, the cons with this is that it still requires learning the habits. Uh, there's still a lot of work when going to redeploy something because it's not scripted. And uh, my current methods, I was hoping to get a little bit farther than this, but I didn't, uh, do require a GUI web browser uh, to be accessible. Um, there's also, I've sort of got things in two different categories. There's my critical and my not. And most of my stuff is not. Uh, the critical stuff does get backed up automatically. Uh, it sends an email every night when it does that. And it's still not ideal because it's just once a night. It's not versioned. Uh, but it gets the job done. And as far as critical, that's basically everything that I need paperwork-wise for life, whether it's tax returns, whether it's uh, driver's license, and change registers, any bank documentation, et cetera. <coughs> I have all that digitized, and it's all on a backup that runs nightly, so that if my house burns down, I've still got a copy somewhere. Doesn't prevent me from deleting something and then letting the backup run, and then, oopsies, there it goes. Do have a couple plans in place for that, but that's sort of tangentially related. Um, Non-critical stuff isn't backed up, just registered as a pet. Um, that would be basically stuff that's not actual data, but again, these configs and stuff that I've taken forever to figure out. For example, when I figure, uh, I have a collector box that does reverse SSH tunnels. So I have a box at my grandparents, a box at my mom's, et cetera, uh, for tech support purposes. And this thing spins up a reverse SSH tunnel to my stuff so that I can SSH into their network and you know do things and help them, and et cetera, et cetera. That's not critical. I could rebuild that if I had to. But it'd be nice to have it backed up in some fashion or another in not going so far down the road as to have the whole thing Ansible to be able to rebuild the whole box from scratch. There are like five different things that I do and it's mostly scripted when I build one of those boxes, but I need that document somewhere. Um, I do want to point out though that nightly backups are probably the bare minimum you should be doing if you care about anything at all as far as data is consumed. Uh, again, it's not the greatest, but it works. Um, the way I have mine set up is there is a backup script crontab.sh that's basically a wrapper for backup script.sh. Uh, because of the way that the permissions need to be with the encrypted home directory and whatever else that I have set up. Uh, currently, I do have a couple registered pets. Uh, later on, you'll see me registering a pet, this laptop I'm presenting on. Uh, my password crack machine, which I use for, if any of you are familiar with Ice Age events, uh, I have a box that has three GPUs in it that I use for that, and it took a bit of fiddling with drivers and whatnot to get it set up right. So that was a good sort of use case for this. Uh, also that reverse SSH collector box, there are a lot of goofy things with permissions to keep it both secure and let the SSH keys work with about 12 different users, et cetera. Uh, so that took some fiddling to figure out how to get all the permissions to work, right? So that's also 
uh, registered. But currently, unregistered pets are my main workstation, uh, which is scary. It should be registered. I'm probably going to do that when I get home, but I also want to figure out a little bit more automated way to do this. You all like this, maybe I'll hover around two for how to just manually or automatically dump this stuff into GitLab or GitHub. Uh, so, but things that I know I need to do on there are my Etsy F stab. Uh, I need a software inventory and anything that's not on my NFS server that's part of my nightly backup. Uh, my main workstation also has a Windows partition, and basically I care about a software inventory and anything that's not in my OneDrive account. Uh, everything else on there is kind of like, hey, whatever. Uh, my main laptop, which is this, and I have a Kodi box, uh, which I just want an inventory of what media I have on there and whatnot. Uh, other pets, as I'm considering them, that I want to register, if you will, um, are my firewall configs. So that's something really easy because I generally use pfSense, which is just an XML file. So it works really well with a versioning system like GitLab or GitHub. Um, Manage switch configs, it's not a nice text file. You, one of the things I'm considering and you could do is you base64 encode it or something like that and then store that and then that can be versioned so that you have versioning but you're not dealing with the raw file upload to uh, something like GitLab or GitHub. Um, also, I found that spreadsheets can be a really good thing here, um, such as uh, here you can see one of my switches, I have the layout of what ports are what VLANs. So I have VLAN 1 here on these four and these four, VLAN 50 on these, 25 on these. This one is a trunk, but it only allows those two VLANs, and then those four are trunks for everything. Um, Unify, I use Unify for Wi-Fi, so the configs for that is something else that I want to have some sort of backup, but not necessarily a part of my uh, main backup. I just kind of want notes on it, so that if I had to rebuild it, I could. Also, the rack layout. You can see off to the right, it's a little bit small, but I've got a 42U rack, and I have where all the equipment's at, which is really nice. If you ever need to move it, you disassemble it to move it. Uh, and then it's like, great, where was this in this one here or this one here? I know it was somewhere in here. Oh, spreadsheet. Uh, of course, then this leads to sprawl. It's like, well, now I'm storing stuff in GitLab and a spreadsheet. So to so sort of narrow that down and to, again, to each their own, this is what I do. Is it a config file? Great, goes in GitLab. Is it documentation that's going to be shared with an end user? Uh, my parents, my grandparents, whatever. That goes in Google Drive. Is it or should it be a spreadsheet? I know that you can make things config files that should be spreadsheets, but should it be a spreadsheet? If it should be a spreadsheet, it's probably going to Google Drive. Um, if it's just notes to self about setting something up, that'd work just as well in either, so you might as well put it in GitLab and have it a little bit more easily versioned and whatnot. Um, and as far as the pet <laughs> registration, if it's not functional, don't register it. Uh, when I started sort of down this route, I ran into this thing where I'd be like, great, I think I got it working. Let me save everything and take notes on it, never look at it again. And then I realized that it wasn't actually working. So then I went back and I fixed the thing, but I forgot to change my documentation. So then when I actually needed to spin it up again, I was looking at the wrong documentation and it took me forever to figure out why the thing wasn't working. And then I'm like, why is this thing purple? Have I clicked on this? Oh, right. Um, so yeah, don't, don't register it if it's not functional yet. Um, things that I still need to find a good way to register that I haven't thought about a whole lot, but that I would like to. If anyone has any ideas on this sort of thing, great. Um, domain registration and structure. Watch I registered where, subdomains, I have Tennessee names, A records, MX, et cetera, uh, across about five different domains, across three different registrars. So it'd be nice to have a way to document that process. Um, IP addressing, I know that there are tools that do this specifically, but again, if I'm gonna be my stubborn self and say I'm only using GitLab and Google Drive, then I think it would make sense to find a good way to put this in GitLab. And I don't know, maybe those tools can export something that would be storable in GitLab, maybe not. Um, port forwards, NATs, et cetera, what lives where, where my printer's at, what devices are on the IoT net versus my main network, et cetera. Also, SSH keys, I'm still just sketched out enough by you know, the cloud that I don't want to be storing private SSH keys in GitLab. I know a lot of people do if it's private and you're two-factored and all that. <coughs> And I know that I'm not that big of a target for any government or whatever, but I still don't want to do it. So I haven't found a real good way to do that, but I at least want to make note of, like, okay, the key ID or whatever, and what's what's where and what is it used for, and et cetera, et cetera. If I'm um, driving a file safe. What? 
thumb drive in a file safe, in a fire safe? Yeah, but then that's not versioned and backed up. So as far as the physical key storage, that'd probably be a good idea. But then I'd still want something to reference the key and say, here's what that key actually goes to type stuff. Because sure, you can, I can keep a, a key to my front door in a lockbox all day long. If I've got a front door and a garage and a car and whatever else and the key's real generic looking, you, I, you may take a while before like, great, what's, one, what's this one going to? If you have a key ring with five keys on them and you got seven different locks, you're going, some customers going through your head. Um, so, what? Good file names? That would probably work. Yeah. And, and again, <laughs> some of this is stuff that I just kind of thought, I'll figure that out eventually. And the safety deposit box? <laughs> A good for the safety file deposit box? What? Did you say a good for the safety file deposit no, it's box? Just like, dude, put your thumb drive in a safety deposit box with good names. Well, right, but well, then I guess that makes sense. So you're saying name the SSH key files themselves based on what they go to? Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. I hope the guy in the box above you doesn't store magnets in his. <laughs> Flash drive? Flash Why do you really be bothered by that? <laughs> there are some good magnets. YouTube videos on that. <laughs> Tangentially related. Uh, oh, it's testicle. So this part, if we can turn the camera away or something, we're just going to let the fish out. But uh, I am going to register a pet. Uh, I'm going to attempt to register my laptop. And here are the things that I really care about on this laptop mm -hmm. that I want back then. I, and it's basically just going to be copy and paste into GitLab at this point. Uh, if you've ever used GitLab, this would probably be pretty boring if you've never used it. It might be like, oh, hey, look at that. Um, I care about my NCF stem. I care about my install package list, which, interestingly enough, it's harder than you might think to figure out what hib I installed on this box, not just what's installed. Uh, this big nasty command here seems to do it, though, so we're going to try that. And it's a live double, so it'll probably fail. Uh, and then I want to see if I have anything in my root context. I feel like I might have some automation here that I want to make sure I back up, too. If that points to anything, that would also be something I want to back up. Um, so let me see if I can figure out how to switch this into mirror mode. And uh, we'll go back to that site right there. Feel free to get a screenshot of that QR code before I figure out how to switch to mirror mode if you want that links to this presentation. And also, just to point out, you can uh, store all of your binary files in Git. You really shouldn't. <laughs> which is which is part of why I thought about doing the base 64 encoding. Because it's like, I want to store some, but I don't want to store them as a binary. I don't want to be that guy, but I also want to be that guy. So your, your uh, spreadsheets, most of them you can unzip now. And they're just XML under the hood. Yeah. Yeah. And you can store that. And it will version quite nicely. What because about an HP switch.cnf file? What, what about just like CSV? Uh, potentially a good option, but a lot of what I was doing is format. Yeah. Uh, like, especially for the rack layout. If it's a for you rack layout, I want to see over here that I have it. And I could repeat it. I get that there are ways that I can sort of work around that. But just for visual stuff. The spreadsheets I'm mostly using for visual type stuff. Uh, and I also I also consider just manually writing stuff in an HTML table and doing it that way. Uh, but again, decided against it. Okay, so you could store way. it in LaTeX too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, again, I'm stubborn. That might be a good thing for me then. Uh, let's see if I can oh wait, I can pass around. I'm only trying to type something in. You'll never get it to look the way you want it to, but. <laughs> but it'll be formatted all right. Isn't that the point of that? Just that you never quite get it right. Yeah. And then, okay, so here is my personal machine config. So I am going to, for here, uh, you can see I have a password crack folder, and here's all my stuff for the password crack machine. So one of the things that I found really interesting was that the uh, controller for the uh, graphics card fans did not like to go to 100% on its own. It would let them overheat before it got there. <laughs> uh, so once I finally found the stupid command to manually set the fan to 100%, and since it's across three GPUs, you have to run it three different times, um, 
I guess I haven't tried running all of them, so I should try that now. Uh, either way, I'm like, here's the thing. No other documentation on it because it was on some weird forum post that didn't make a lot of sense. And the command wasn't even completely right. I had to modify it. Um, so I'm just like, here, here are your three commands. Run these and you're good to go. Um, there are also some, like, I have a hashtag script uh, that I use for doing the team specific, cracking the team specific passwords there. Um, Just as a matter of suggestion there in your uh, fan script, mm -hmm. uh, it's generally considered better if you move your pseudo out to the, the outside of the script rather Usually. than... Yeah, and do a who am I and everything else. I'm just running everything as root on there for the most part, so I don't really care. That machine is one of those where it's like, I don't care about security, just make the thing work. It's off mm -hmm. most of the time anyway because it's a power hog. Um, yeah, and I run into some weird permission issues with the way NVIDIA drivers and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we will call this, uh, and the message is laptop pet. Uh, this is probably the most effective commit message I've had in a very long time. Um, great, so let's so see. Good stuff, John. <laughs> let's see what I said I wanted. I want Etsy F stat. Right? So let's Objects. Yeah, character <laughs> there, we there we go, there's some fun stuff. <laughs> and you can see, let's see, do I care about the UID? No, but I do care. I changed this swap thing a little bit. So basically, I care about these lines. And what I'm going to do here, and, I, and you could just copy and paste the whole thing or upload it. And once it's automated, that's probably what it will do. But for the meantime, this is sort of my process as my stubborn little self. Um, And we will go so I'm making a note to myself here at the top that these are just the modified lines for Metzgaff stab and you can even see those comments from there from when I had some old stuff. And then uh commit message, sure, add new file. Uh, bam. Now if I need to rebuild this laptop, I can go in here and I can pull out that line and tack it onto the end etf stab, and if I decide to keep the swap thing great, if not great. And if there's a version difference in the next version of Ubuntu that uses, say, uh, or for example, these UUIDs, if I were to just copy and paste this whole file and then restore the whole file, well, the UUID is going to be different. It's going to break the dang thing, uh, which is, again, part of why working around these types of things was part of what drove me away from doing a more Ansible thing. Again, with the time, I could probably figure it out. I just chose to go around. Um, let's see. Do I have anything on Let's go here. Uh, yes, I do. I have an auto section. This is one of those things that uh, phones home. So let's take that and then go. Uh, can you hit uh, Control Plus a couple times? Yeah. Oh, it's a little small. Almost. Oh, so. Oop, give me your explosive. How's that? Yay! <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the. Yeah. Who's the. Who's the devil of a body? There we go. Oops. Maybe. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm dropping in this line, which is basically every five minutes from this script. Uh, and that's probably the wrong way to do programming, but I'm not a programmer, so I don't care. Um, now I'm going to see. Uh, what this script actually is. I'm not too worried about anyone here seeing this, but I also don't want it on the internet forever, which is why we're not live streaming this part. And you can see exactly how this part works. And then I'm going to go and copy that. And we'll say, laptop. And we'll 
it says the file and oh, well, SSH. Does it not let me type in a file when I zoom to this file? So file name would be And then what I'm actually going to do for this though is I'm going to say, make this bigger again. Uh, this is there's probably a more standardized way to do this, but I'm just going to say the script lives at app. Okay. Um, because I tend to type up things. So it is right there. And then you can see that what this does is it runs an auto SSH. Um, this is basically, I believe, a debug level output. This is dropped to the background, keep alive interval, yada, yada, yada. Auto SSH, for those of you that don't know, basically tries to connect uh, an SSH session over and over and over. You can see there's the local port that it opens for me to listen back. You can see there's where it grabs the, uh, the SSH key from, which is probably something I should document at some point and then it tells it what host name or no that's the uh, the user on this box is currently offline uh, that then it would connect to and we'll save and I think that was about it wasn't it oh install package list let's see if this breaks this would be really funny one way or the other and then uh, I'll quit boring y'all and take any questions one more time so let's go uh, terminal and type this bigger Okay, let's paste this in. It's pasting from the internet. It's always been in. <laughs> um, and you can see pretty much everything here is stuff that I have actually installed at one point or another. Whether or not I actually want it installed is another story potentially. Uh, but I am going to actually, so that I also know what I did for the command to get this list, I'm going to go here. I'm going to make a new file. Does that include dependencies that they didn't install? No, just this is just that. stuff that I ran an apt install or an apt get install or an apt to install. And something that present. So, kind of. Uh, give me just a second here and I'll show you. Uh, let me click in there without it being super zoomed in. I'm not even going to give this an extension. Uh, I'm just going to paste that. Okay, great. Come Ta da. Okay, so what this does is. Um, apt mark show manual will tell you things that you manually install. Well, the problem is it really doesn't. It shows you a lot of stuff. Uh, and it appears to include things like dependencies of the stuff that you manually install. Um, I'm not completely sure how that works, but some genius online figured this out. If you look at this initial status, uh, it basically shows you everything that was installed within like the first couple runs of apt or something after the machine was installed. I don't completely understand how it works. Uh, and then it gzips it. So if you ungzip it and use that as a comparison marker, um, and you're also grepping for lines that start with package, because the, the list actually shows you things like, uh, you can see the parentheses here. That's all basically one big command. Uh, when you just do this part, here, I'll show you. Why not? Um, you get a list that includes all the descriptions and all that. So if we you just run that, then yeah, I dropped the G. Um, then you get all this too. You get the description, you get the architecture, the multi arch For my purposes of just registering a pet, basically if I want to write a script that says apt get install or apt install blog to reinstall everything I have. What do I need to put in this, is that blog? That's my main goal for this, so that I can let it read out. And again, part of the whole Ansible and all that is I don't necessarily want it to have a specific version of the thing. I just want the thing installed. I don't care that I have version 2.1 of VLC. I care that I have VLC. Um, and yeah, and some of these things, uh, as you can see, here's the package line, which is the package name that you would type, which is why that command that was back here somewhere, this guy. Oh, it's going to take a minute. There we go. Uh, that's why this guy has this little set piece where it basically strips out the actual name of the package and then it sorts them both by name and then it's doing some sort of a comparison on that. I don't fully understand copy and paste it on another machine first. 
that was more important to me. Uh, so I figured it's perfectly safe to run on my laptop that I hear about Elon Musk. Uh, um, so yeah, so that's how that part works, at least on Ubuntu. Uh, you can see I've installed curl, I've installed Chromium, I've installed Chirp from amateur radio stuff. Uh, I must have needed to compile something from source runs because automates on there. Audacity is another one I know I use a lot. Uh, if I were really smart, I'd actually go through this list and see what I actually care about. I don't necessarily need my proprietary printer software installed on my laptop. So which ones of those are like PPA? I don't know. So if they were PPA only type things. Um, then I would get an error and then I'd need to go track down where they came from. Um, so maybe that's that's a good point. Maybe as part of my registering my pet, I should look at App sources. Yep, and one of the and actually one of the things that I would like to do better with my pet registration process is uh, a, basically a list of all the things that I should be taking down. You know, when you go to register your pet for local authorities, that's a, a canine, for example, they have the things they want to know. They want to know its vaccination date. They want to know it's probably its name. They want to know your name. But they already know all the stuff that they're going to ask you. So it's, to that same vein, I feel like I should be able to come up with something that says, here's all the stuff that I care about about a machine to be able to rebuild the thing in a relatively timely manner that is not overkill and that it doesn't really matter what happens to the machine because I can have the same pet later. I don't, uh, another pet that I need to register that I forgot to put on the list is my, uh, I have a Raspberry Pi that all it does is it clicks, it virtually clicks a button on a garage door opener so that I can control my garage door opener over Wi-Fi. Uh, but it has a web page for that, it has a CGI script, and it has a relay, and I want to document where's the relay plugged in, where's Python script am I running to trigger the relay, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, do um, you have any, like, uh, hand compiled uh, software on any of these pets? Not that I care about. Okay. Um, and then, like, do you have a plan for how you're going to do that? It's, uh, do what? To, to hand compile? You know, like how to like reproduce your hand compile. I don't know that much is, hand, I don't know that I have anything that is hand compiled that I can. So the stuff that was, when you say hand compiled, are you talking like that I actually compiled it and use that installed version? Yeah, you like yeah. make installed last. The only times that I've actually done that on this particular machine, anyways, is when I was working on a very specific CTF style thing. So like at SecDSM one time, there was a, uh, an image processing thing that I was trying to get to before anyone else. So I was just installing random software from the internet that I found <laughs> to try and make it work. And as part of that, I'm like, great. Well, it's not in the repositories. Let's build it and see what happens. Uh, I've never touched that since, and I'm never going to. And if I do, then I would, I would document uh, probably, uh, I'd probably make a separate file that would basically be a shell script and I would say, here's how I ran dot config. Here's how, you know, I'd, I'd prob uh, probably be a screen session or something or whatever that ASCII mation thing you use is. Oh, the uh, ASCII anima yeah, cinema that sort of thing. Yeah, ASCII cinema, yeah, that guy. Um, I'd probably do something like that so that I knew everything I was doing. Like if I knew this is something I'm gonna want once I'm done with it, then I would make note of everything I do in the process and then go back and parse it down and say, okay, well, I ran these seven commands, and it basically was three commands that I was undoing a couple times, because uh, I end up doing a lot of that because I'm definitely not a genius. Uh, and then I'd save that as a shell script and say, hey, when you go to compile the software, here's what worked at this date and time, or I could see from the commit when I wrote it, uh, because there's also a good chance that that will, that will break if they update something. Because the couple times I used to compile software for things, it seemed like it I'd write a script for it and then it would break with the next version they released. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, I do have some stuff that I should probably be backing up, like Yubico. I use YubiKey's stuff on this laptop, so that might be handy. Um, Chirp is, the again, the amateur radio programming thing I use. I use that. And Pass is my password manager. I should probably have that backed up somewhere. Um, and in fact, that was an issue. When I did a disk upgrade on this, uh, about a week afterwards, I started getting errors with my password manager saying that there was like a version conflict or something with the, the sync version, uh, the sync copy of the data. I'm like, what's going on? And I finally figured out that on upgrade, the PPA 
sources list got disabled, so I had to go back and re-enable that with the new version. It wasn't too hard to find, but if this would have been a clean machine, that might have taken a lot longer to find. To solve your, Stephen, your uh, 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 compile, uh, customize stuff, I'd argue that might be a good uh, spot for Docker. You make a Docker uh, file of your build, and then you end up with the artifacts as the end result that you can copy you back onto the main. Yeah, but I love Dockerizing all the things. So. Presentation is it's a it's an in between. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you're doing like ninety percent of the hard work of dockerizing slash analyzing all of your stuff. Because I feel like most of the hard work is like determining what the configuration you want to get at. It's like determining what you want and what you care about and the scripting it up is you know, it could be. I, but again a lot of that too then is okay, so now I'm keeping track of I have Docker. Let's just say I don't, but let's just say I have Docker. Okay, great. So then what images on what machine? Because I don't have enough hardware on any one machine to run everything I want to do. Just throw everything in the Docker files and put that. And then maybe like name the Docker files and like what machine it's going to be and what it's going to do. So like this machine dash, this thing it's going to do. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And then the, the one time I did try to use Docker recently, Andy had to help me out because I was lost. I'm like, this isn't working. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, and you have to enable that working thing at the command, and then the tutorial was wrong, and yada yada. And I'm like, watch this, apt install. Hey, look, it works. So, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like there's just enough, and again, part of this is that I'm stuck, and I fully admit that. I, and if you're doing it, probably any more scale than I am. It's probably, and even at the scale that I am maybe, it's probably more stupid to do it this way than it is to use Docker. Well, but but that's also- Just use a shell script. Yeah. Like 90% of what Docker is gonna do for you is really just, it's a way to have, it's a shell script that you can, you know, there's a, you can report it. You could also just do it with a shell script. Well, some of it, yeah. So the in this in case anyone cares about the hump, the hump bag, if anyone cares about getting the presentation out of it, there's that. Uh, like for configs, you would just be like, you know, pipe this data file to this config, you know that just shell script. Yeah, but there's a whole bunch of things. Then I'm having to figure out how to build the shell script because, like, for example, the etcf step file. If I'm just tacking lines onto the end, that's fine. But one of those is I'm actually editing the swap file line. And then I'm adding a couple lines on the end, but I want to keep everything else the same. So now I'm parsing, okay, so is it is it slash swap? Is it slash var swap? Is it, you know, where do they mount it in this version of the OS if they change that between versions? Uh, and then, you know, obviously tacking the lines on the end, that's a really easy edit. You can just cap with the two caret symbols. So like the swap that you could do is maybe just like find any line that contains the word swap, delete it, replace it, with, replace it with this. I may not want to completely do that as part of it, because I want to be able to reproduce it, but I, because I, I wanted, if I remember right, I wanted the swap in the same place as it was, but I wanted to change the disk that it was mounted on, if I remember right. I don't know. I don't remember 100% why I was well, playing just the like swap. Say the but yeah, and that's, and that's just it, is it's like, how much do I actually want to take the time to figure out how to script versus just copying and pasting a few things here and there. Like with my with my password cracker box, for example, um, I anticipate needing to rebuild that maybe once. And after that, I'll probably have a completely different setup that won't be relevant to, uh, to the current config and I'll be starting from scratch anyway. So for that context, I mean, you saw there are like five files there that actually matter in terms of doing it. I may just build a shell script, and I've done this before, that writes out the scripts to all the different files and then call that good. I may not, because by the time I, you know, reformat everything and basically echo this line out, echo this line out, echo this line out, echo this line out, okay, that script's written. So echo the next seven lines out to the next script. Let's echo the next seven lines out to the next script. At that point, I might as well have just copied and pasted it all into the new box, and then when that box is dead, it's dead anyway, and I'm rebuilding it from scratch. You just save all of the files. 
One of the things you could do is have your repo, uh, clone your repo down to the, the root directory and then just add in the files that you care about and then when it comes time to restore them, they'll be in the right spot. Yep, and one and of the things, yeah, and one of the things I'm working on is similar to that. Uh, I know that I've read a fair bit about how you can use SSH keys to basically directly interact with GitLab and GitHub and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get to the point that I basically have a script that I feed it, here's my list of files, here's the full path to the list of files I care about. And it says, great, and it puts them all up into GitLab for me and checks, you know, recent version and all that, and it's like, well, wait a second, this modification time different, yada, yada, here's what you really want. And it just sort of does all that in the background. And if I need to push a new change, then great. I also feel like 90% of the shell scripts I write are just all of the commands I would have typed in the command line, just listed in the root. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I can't, yeah. you know, like, you know, there's some command line parameters occasionally and like, right. you know, right. occasionally well, like an if statement or two. And, and a lot if I'm of, doing more than that, I'm probably not even writing in shell scripts anymore. Right, well that's just it. And a lot of my shell scripts are that too, but a lot of what I end up doing actually isn't a shell script or a set of commands. It's more go in and edit this file and find this one specific line in this specific file and modify it this specific way. Or you, you could just at save that point that you might want set. You need to learn how to edit that line in that file. Using set or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they change something about the syntax in the next version of the program and that same set of things is no longer on. Once you get that skill to be able to just search and replace for a thing in the file, you will just get it automatically what? and start doing it. Why don't you save and copy the whole file? Why do you need to edit this one line? Let the poor man live. What about the whole file? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I opened up the questions. <laughs> Yeah, and and I don't want to save the whole file a lot of times because a lot of times the default options that are changed in programs. Like for example, when uh, here's a good example. So SSH, uh, it used to be that the known hosts file was just straight up. Here's your IP address. Here's your host name, and you know here's the key that goes with it. Someone along the way decided that's probably not the most secure way to do that, is it? And they changed the default option now in Ubuntu at least is that it's all, uh, everything's one-way hash. And you have to enter, well, you can manually interact with it by one-way hashing, for example, an IP address. So if you say 127.0.0.1, you can use the, I don't even remember what the thing's called, but there's a command, something along the lines of known host. SSH add? Yeah, it's, it it's that, something and then like it's that, one yeah. of the parameters, queries, basically, the known host file, and you say, what hosts are 127.0.0.1? And it says, yeah, I found that on line four, five, and seven. I'm like, okay, great. If I would have just backed up the config files, the whole thing, I'd still be using the insecure method of using IP addresses in my, my host file. By backing up just what I care about, which is you know disable root login and allow key-based authentication and set a, uh, and then a fail to ban setup, which is I know not directly in the SSH config. If those are the only options in that file I'm changing, then improvements like this, where they improve the security for me by changing default options, I don't have to worry about accidentally overwriting those because I just clobbered the whole damn file. Which is part of the reason I have to for this, because there have been enough times that I did that and regretted it. And I'm like, dang it, why didn't why didn't I just change the three things I needed to change instead of the whole file? Well, and I get a lot of people may have it the other way around. Mm -hmm. You may be like, well, I only changed what I thought I needed, and now I ended up changing the whole file anyway. So, you know, again, it's sort of one of the to each their own. Mm -hmm. And again, this is what works for me. Is it going to work for you? Maybe, maybe not. If it works for you, I feel sorry for you. Uh, but I at least hope that you can glean something from this and be like, ooh, that gives me an idea. On this box I have over here, I haven't touched in three years. I should try this thing similarly related because... I feel like what I get out of this is don't let the, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Because yeah. uh, I think all of my boxes at home are fairly pets. Yeah, and they and don't have anything. There's no documentation or backup or anything. And I, I see you and I preach like, you should script everything out. I script yeah. my own thing. <laughs> 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 well, that's just it. I do it for work, yes, of course. But, you know, that's somebody else's nice, pretty things. And, you know, I can live in a pile of mud, but. <laughs> well, and that's I what that was. Yeah, and that doctor was, healed itself. <laughs> and that was what kind of got me started on this. Was I'm like, 
I felt like Docker was such a high bar for me to try and get to that I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to push it off, push it off, push it off. And then when I did have to do a clean install, and then it was missing something, I'm like, oh, son of a... Like, this is a nightmare because I don't know anything because I didn't do anything because I thought I had to do it in Docker. <coughs> Curse you, past self. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at least here, at least, at least I'm doing something. And it pays me to admit it, but my first attempt was actually just using Google Drive for everything and just pasting in configs into Google Drive documents because you get free storage there if it's in a Google Drive document. Um, yeah, that didn't work very well. The formatting and copying and pasting into a terminal, it was not happy about that. Also, the versioning. Google has an interesting way of doing versioning where it doesn't actually version everything like it says it does. It's <laughs> sort of like based on date and time that it thinks you were done editing it because there's no actual save button. So sometimes I'd actually have like, you know, a machine that I stopped working halfway through something and then came back to it. And it's like, hey, look, here's your version where you have a partially complete command halfway in the middle of it. So that's where I moved to GitLab, where it's a very intentional, <coughs> you know, click here to do this. Plus, GitLab had private repos first, which is why I ended up on GitLab instead of GitHub. Now I'd probably pick GitHub if I were doing it from the start, but maybe not. I like their UIs better their web UI and everything. That's really the only reason. So GitLab does have a web IDE uh, since you, you yep. seem to like that's the, what I just did. Yep. Uh, and I know you can have multiple files uh, that you edit all at once and the benefit to that is you have all of the changes and a snapshot of your box of all the stuff you wanted to save in that one commit. That way you don't have to try and play the subway oh, map okay. Frogger game to <laughs> figure out. That makes sense. Yeah, and I definitely do want to at some point get to the point where it's more automated than it is now. Mm -hmm. I just don't really know what that looks like. I'm guessing it'll be something along the lines of um, any, basically the scripts that run when you do an upgrade. And it tells you like, hey, this has been modified by, you know, you or something else since the last update that this installer apt put in place. What do you want to do? So if I can basically figure out what they're doing for all those files and just run a scan and say, what did I change? And then what lines in it did I change? And just only put the changed lines into GitLab. If I could write a script that did that, then I feel like that would be basically complete as far as this project is concerned. And I wouldn't feel the need to learn Docker beyond for the fun of it and then potentially future projects on better hardware and whatnot, or if I completely format something I have already. I think the advantage of maybe Docker is right now, it's like, you could probably run, sounding, from what it sounds like you two have, you could probably run a fair bit of the server remix of your system on you know, a big stack of Raspberry Pi's that would be pretty expensive. And just, you know, lob all your individual servers at it. And then, you know, if a Raspberry Pi dies, you just replace that one Pi. You know, 30 pies can do an awful lot. Yeah. Uh, $35 a pie. Yeah. Well, it's a fairly inexpensive way to do a lot of stuff. 50 once you get all the required hardware. Once you get a case and an SD card and the heat sinks and the power supply, and it's closer to fit, which is still cheap, but. Never underestimate yeah, the yeah. airflow of a box <laughs> fan. <laughs> True. You, you could use Pi Zeros if you're, if you're concerned about that and make a Pi Rack. Oh, but then I can't wire them. Then I need Ethernet adapters. And uh, another thing you might want to consider using GitHub, uh, right now you're storing each uh, server or each machine in a separate folder. Mm -hmm. Branches may, especially once you get to the automated part, that way you aren't carrying around your entire world in uh, one uh, thing. You could have my laptop, and it looks almost like you're my desktop and etc. once you get that scripted. That way you just have to check out that branch onto that, that machine. I, I think where that would make sense would be if you have a high degree of uh, overlap, like a redundancy in the configuration. Yeah. And some if of it is. If you don't have a high degree of configuration, I feel like that's actually kind of It's worth considering. Yeah. I love yeah, new branches. You things like you could merge, you could merge your configuration from one to the other. So like, it's like, oh, I found out there's this new way to like set up all my NGINX or Apache or whatever. And I want to do that for all my, you know, random yeah. 
you know, you'd be just like, well, virtual you know, ones yeah. go to everybody. You're like, you know. Well, like my, so my laptop and my, my main desktop at home, but the Ubuntu side of it, of course, uh, are very similar. They both have the NFS mount point. They both have a, a customized swap space. I still can't remember what I did. Did I just disable it? Was that, is that all I did? I don't remember. Anyhow, um, they both have the Chirp software. They both have my password. I mean, they're very, very similar to each other. Uh, they both have Chrome. Uh, Whereas my zone minder machine, I don't have any of that. Like, why would I? That that machine is supposed to be doing one thing, and it's a virtual machine running on a host that's on tendril physical hardware. So uh, that that whole thing, like, basically the only thing on there is zone minder and required dependencies. So that box wouldn't make sense to be sort of the same pool as everything else. But yeah, my my laptop and my work main workstation. Those should be pretty darn similar, and if they're not, that means I probably screwed something up along the way, and I just haven't noticed it yet. Um, also, then my Windows side of it—that's going to be a real interesting thing to do. Um, I want to find a good way to put registry keys in GitLab. Which I know there are a few ways to do that, but I haven't found a good way yet. <laughs> I know, scary, right? I I found trying to back up registry keys have always been. You can always export. Well, yeah, you can export yeah. it as a dot reg. You can have it as a command yeah, file. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
platforms got 192 gigs of RAM just waiting to get a beta. It's actually off right now, doing absolutely nothing. Oh, did that come from someone in this room? <laughs> uh, the, the RAM did, yes, thank you. But uh, the rest of the computer did not. <laughs> so the, the, the only thing about it is, is like the Windows license alone, if you're going to give them a like, Windows license. I wouldn't even bother with the license or something like that. You don't need a license. Yeah, you have a certain number of days of grace before your... You have like unlimited trial period, don't you? Yeah, about the the well, you've also got you've also got the if you really want to if you really just want to deal with it, uh, what you do is you get the Internet Explorer and Edge test VMs. It's a whole pre-installed Windows, but you don't even have to install Windows. It's just a VM. You download the like eight gig zip and unpack it. And for thirty days, you can do basically whatever you want. I think you can only run it for like eight hours or something before it shuts down on you or something like that. Like there's some weird glitch with it. And then yeah, you basically can't, like I even tried to like snapshot it so I could restore it to another, no, it. The whole point is that have Windows or something to it. Yeah, you, it, it does pretty much whatever you want, but it's got some weird like root kitty type things in there that prevent it from ever being usable past the 30 days. Whoa. So you really need to download a fresh copy, but if you've registered your pets, you know what you did to it in the meantime, so we're going to go. The other issue that comes in, I don't know how well uh, WSL2 will play with that because by nature you're already inside of a VM and depending yes. on what VM world you're in, once you try VMception, uh, very bad things can happen and it doesn't play well. What's the worst that happens? It doesn't work? It's because that's also a Hyper-V, and Hyper-V won't play well with like VM virtual modules. It doesn't like other virtual modules. Challenge accepted. Yeah. Now, EC2, it may be emulating close enough to bare metal that it will play nice, but... I've gotten Docker to that on Windows. And that requires which, which does not work at VMware or uh, uh, whatever whatever things Docker for Windows or Windows for the longest time we were using that suddenly before Hyper V that thing could be tiny uh more than Docker. No no no, but you couldn't run Hyper V inside the uh, and I believe virtual and boxes is in there even. Yeah, they, they were and it was terrible. But like you, you can't. I don't think inside your VMware VM or your VirtualBox VM can you run your hybrid from Docker. Like I think it gets very angry. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure WSL2. The interesting thing they did differently is they listed on a VM. Yeah, WSL2 actually runs the external in the VM. I think it's probably going to add a fair number of limitations to it. Files are actually running Linux instead of trying to do the. Yeah, Inmap actually works now. That was my biggest gripe with the first version of WSL. It's, it's like, hey, look, now I have proper Nmap instead of weird Windowsy Nmap. And then you try to run it, and it's like, yeah, no. No, these libraries are completely broken. You don't know what you're doing. Go away. I guess my concern with the direction that this OT is going is I always have cared very much about all of my hardware I was working on. And I really want to use my GPU and my you know, custom PCI Express cards. And I feel like that's just like, I'm, I'm concerned that that's going to be changed. After it has always been kind of a janky. Well, but it's it's still better than status quo, where you just have to, like, I guess I don't see the direction being bad because it's not like we're going to eliminate Linux on bare metal. We're just providing another option. But for I mean, it. like you, but like I'm saying, versus WSL1. 
No. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I'm saying. But, but I think it's, it would be easier to import. Nobody did. But I think it would be easier to import. It's just like, oh God, the amount of shit that's broken, I would not want to even touch it. Now, the big question is can you run wine on WSL? <laughs> yeah, someone went out and did that. <laughs> <laughs> I like, the those, I like the I tone of voice for that. <laughs> Just imagining the person through the internet. They spent so much time trying to figure out if they could, they never stopped to think if they should. I mean, I hey, that reminds run. me when I first discovered VNC and VNC'd into the machine that I was working from. <laughs> that is and then I'm like, though. why did it crash? Let me try that again. I, I've totally run wine inside a Linux Docker container on a Windows Wow. Is this the person you pictured through the internet? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason He's is got more beard than I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, stuff, stuff's already in your Linux container. And, like, you don't want, like, the, having a separate component, you have to, like, reach out and say, I just need this one little thing. It's a but you were hurry on Windows. Yeah, you can just run a Windows Docker. <laughs> but you can't run Not Windows image. To that. You can't run a Windows yeah, Docker image easy. and a Linux Docker image on the same host at the same time. Right, it's true. So I had reasons. Maybe not good reasons, but reasons. <clears throat> most of my reasons are. It seemed like a good idea. <laughs> most of my reasons are avoid VMs or the possibility or dealing with VM management. I don't that mind VMs. I just thought I'd be in there. Uh, Register them as pets. <laughs> that's that's actually on my list because I have a uh, my main server that has my zone minder as a VM, it has my NFS as a VM, it has two other things. One's a unified controller, and not much else. The other one I don't even remember what it is. Might have been left over from my terminal server that I tried to run. Uh, but anyhow, yeah, none of that's really like documented. And it's all been kind of clutched together. But that's another thing where replacing the files directly wouldn't work because they changed. So it's a Debian server on the bare metal. And then it's Zen on top of that. And Zen has had so many breaking changes of config files. I actually had even the lines that I edited weren't enough. I had to redo the syntax on this in order to make the thing work at all. So, but but uh, you're running, all the stuff you're running is Linux? Under yeah, it's, a, it's all more Debian servers on, so there are four Debian servers on Zen on Debian. I feel like that is like the use case for that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and very much. That particular set of servers would be very probably benefited from being switched to Docker stuff. However, I, I don't have the hardware to say, here, let me set up Docker here and migrate or anything like that, or you know, let me move my current thing over here and then set up Docker here. So I'd need to do basically an in place, which means downtime, which means scary. So it's just been kind of sitting on the back burner. Yeah, Maybe you can have the Docker daemon running. Because Docker and Linux isn't a VM. There's no VM there's no, there's no Oh, I think as you were saying, so on the bare metal Debian install, no, in the VMs, spin up a Docker container. No, in each of the VMs. So go inside each of your VMs, Dockerize each of your installs in the VM. And, you know, once you have a Docker file for all of them and you're confident it works, then try spooling down your VM, spool up an idea, or, you know, a, a super vanilla VM. Let it run your Docker container. See if it works. Add another one to your, you know, add another one to it. And then when you run these Docker containers on the main Debian install on the bare metal, I mean, eventually. So eventually, okay. but just like start just like having a Docker VM and then just migrate as many things as you can. Like Docker VM. I thought Docker wasn't a VM. No, 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 no. A, VM. a VM running Docker. Just, I don't have enough resources for that. Mm. Unless I kill one of them, which I may be able to because if that fourth one, I don't remember what it does. If it's actually doing <laughs> nothing, then I could repurpose that one. Well, I do think it only has 512 megs of RAM, so that might be an issue. Considering all the others have at least a gig of RAM. I mean, the other thing you could do is just run Docker, run each of the VMs as they are, and Dockerize it in their own VM. Once you have a Docker file for all of them, then just move your Docker file to the host. Yeah, so you're sh basically shut down the four VMs down. and then spin up the Dockers and see what happens. Because then I haven't actually broke anything. 
that makes sense. Now, although there would be a little bit of challenge with that because the the level that Zen is tied into the kernel and whatnot on the particular install that I have anyway, um, I was a little bit freaked out when I upgraded the RAM to, I think it was 32 gigs from eight, or maybe it was 16 for either way. I upgraded it from eight gigs and I was, you know, it's, it's pure headless stuff. There's no GUI on anything. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to remember the command line options to query the RAM and all that. And I was only seeing about a third of the RAM or half the RAM or something like that, a small portion. I'm going, what did I break? Did I get bad RAM? What stick is in it seeing? And then I was able to, when I queried the hardware level stuff, was saying, yes, you have the correct number of sticks at the correct capacities. And I said, okay, show me how much RAM's available total, not just in use, not just free, but total available. And it was a number like a quarter that size. I'm like, what on earth? Well, it turns out that when you allocate RAM to a Zen VM, it actually removes it from the bare metal host being able to see that. Hmm. Which is a really pure way of allocating RAM for sure, but I did not realize it did that until about 24 hours worth of fiddling and sleep and frustration and everything else. That's what? Dedicated for per VM or you do that with much Yeah. Research. Well, and, and what, what caught me, so it also apparently, if I remember right, it only does it when you actually power up the VM. Yeah. So I had everything running when I did my test because, you know, I shut the thing down. I wanted to make sure everything powered back up and then I checked the RAM. Well, and I think it also auto, yeah, it auto turns on the VM when the thing reboots. So I just waited for it to pull everything up and drop the CPU use and hard drive use back down. And that's when I queried it. I'm like, what the go? And then, yeah, I want to say that I turned off a VM and then looked at the RAM use, and it was, it, I, was I was able to see more RAM. Like, it just appeared. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I see how this is going. And then I did the math and said, okay, how much have I allocated to each of the VMs? And how much do I think I have installed? And how much can the base OS see? Okay, yeah, it all adds up to the right number. Now, one of the other perks of dockerizing it is that you can share RAM across inst instances a lot more. So you, yeah, you, can, yep. you can like in dynamically, you don't have to like have, have code yeah. or anything. So I, you know. But you can. Yeah, but I mean you could, but you could also just say, hey, this is the max you can use. And if no one's using, you know, some RAM and there's something that kind of wants some of it, you know. Yeah. So and maybe that's a way you could free up resources because, you know, yeah. are you really using all of the memory you allocated to using RAM all the time? Probably not. And some of them actually need more than I've given it. So, yeah. It, it definitely, I think that that one physical box is definitely a, a flagship use case for Docker. So what, and I just need what to resources get are you running? Uh, so that's the NFS. I've got an NFS server running. I've got a unified controller running. But what, what resources are you running? Like, what, what don't you have that for? RAM, mostly. Um, CPU also, because uh, it's a quad core Phenom chip from like 10 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think I built the box in late 09, so a little bit so more than 10 years like, ago. Isn't that high like that? Mm. Right so <laughs> quad core <laughs> Phenom chip? No. Maybe one core. Maybe one core of the phenom yeah, chips on par with the Raspberry Pi. Because like a quad core phenom, phenom chip is clocked. Here. Is, isn't that like a bulldozer? Something around there, yeah. If it's bulldozer, then it's really like a dual core. It's like a dual core. No, the, the phenoms, the phenoms were true quad core. That was their whole marketing thing against Intel. Was we've got true quad core, and Intel's just duct taping dual cores together. Sure. Okay. Well, but anyway, it's like a Raspberry Pi, and it didn't perform as well. A current Raspberry. I six, like Raspberry Pi 4 is something like a dual core E6600. So maybe just like buy two of those things. You know, the the only there. spot that would uh, give you a little heartburn there though is the Pi is ARM and yeah, not. Linux, okay? It depends on what yeah. some of your stuff is compiled. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so, although for this particular I, use case, I don't think I would care. I don't okay. know what it is, but Phenom 2 X4 965 is a 3.4 years. Okay, whatever. Pass mark for it's about 4,000. Uh -huh. There are much, in 125 watts in Yeah. The amount of power that that thing is consuming, 
could be, you could save money and get a dual board process that probably outperforms that. A modern for, one, yeah. Or something that's 15 yeah. watts in the instead. You're talking a modern one, right? If I were to spend money and replace modern, hardware. You'd still have an Intel processor at that point. I mean, they've yeah. got those uh, G1900. Well, even a Ryzen 3. Uh, Celeron boxes, their quad cores, that I think they have a higher pass mark. You know, I would say a G1900 is a higher pass mark story than that. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised. That's still it. Intel. Yeah, yeah. But those but are then, cheap. But I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if your ARM64 had a point. Well, I'm not sure if you're. But then I'm, but then I'm still looking at. I still need to spend money on hardware. And it's yeah, not just a CPU. It's also RAM and a motherboard. And mm -hmm. but if it's, if yeah. let's say you buy a, a, a Raspberry Pi, it's fifty dollars for the whole kit. Your ROI on that would be fairly quick, realistically, with the the power it usage. I think if you really want to get crazy, you could buy two or three of them. <laughs> Well, then if it's if it's idle most of the time, though, how much of that TDP is actually in use? Is the other thing. Look it up to a kilowatt is about the only way to True. be sure. True. The vast majority of my power use is the fans. So, and hard drives, fans and hard drives is the vast majority. But I mean, if that's your argument, like arms can idle way lower than any x86. True. Yeah. Except maybe an atom, but. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get one of those. Yeah. Yeah, so that You're giving that uh, AMD old 2009 AMD processor a little bit too much uh, credit. I'm pretty sure like the your Raspberry Pi 64 is going to be until Adam. It's going to be like five watt chip. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the current Raspberry Pi 4 is a five watt chip. Well, I'm really curious now what I have in that server. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can find it. The biggest thing you could have missed out on is RAM. Because I think the most you can get on any of the like, ARM boards is for yeah. Um, yeah, actually, a uh, person on the line, if you want to chime in on anything, feel free. I was going to say, I only know their, their phone number, and that doesn't get me very far. How do we turned you up now so we can actually hear you? Oh, okay. Well, cool. I uh, want to introduce yourself since all we know is your uh, phone number. <laughs> Sorry, one, one more time. Sam Oh, hi, Dan. Sam. Or Sam. <laughs> Sorry, the laptop speakers have great fidelity. <laughs> Combined with the noisy room, I probably didn't help. Well, hopefully you at least were able to hear us. For the most part. Anyway, though, I think I'm going to turn off the line here because we're we're pretty much just babbling at this point. All right. Uh, so I'm not sure where Sam is at right now, except for a noisy room with uh, much, much echoing. So basically, I built this box one year, and I built the Phenom one the next year. Um, and yeah, the Phenom has more power, but this is now what has become my password cracker box. Okay. And the high power use of that yeah, just GPU. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this pass mark is for the Q6700, but the QX, since it, for some reason, because it was unlocked, uh -huh. it it just automatically draws more power. I don't understand it. That's how it works. And I can only do like a 0.1 gigahertz overclock before the thing locks up and doesn't even post anyway. 
So whatever, you, that's what they're going to cool down. Did, did you, but that's still that's still a lower score than my AMD. So I mean, I'm yeah. I'm a cheapskate. I don't. My main workstation is a third gen i7. Raspberry Pi, man. So oh, yeah, I feel like Raspberry Pi. This this is a fourth gen right here. This is a fourth gen i3. Like I I'm, I'm cheap. I don't spend money on things other than electricity. The other advantage is if you did go the, yeah. the ARM route, you'd have a much harder time, uh, you know, uh, regressing into Windows land. And so it would help keep you faithful. <laughs> See, if only all the utilities I needed had Linux native clients, like the FOSCAM plugin. So Windows only. Sorry. I don't think okay. Windows, Microsoft did put out a Windows 10 code that does work on like three pies. So, but ARM. So it doesn't have to be. It's not like software is going to be really good for ARM for Windows. Not the FOSCAM plugin, I bet you. <laughs> no. Oh, I did submit a pull request to uh, whatever that. Uh, you you were trying to get to work, so there's a, now a Debian. Oh, uh, nice. The instructions they, I sent you that didn't work. Yeah, if they accept it, there's a, a Debian 10 uh, for oh, whatever program that was. Zone Minder? Yeah, Zone Minder. Yeah. If they accept it, there's a though. Zone the Debian 10 Docker file now for oh, them. Oh, so you didn't use. send it to the Ubuntu one? I, I also sent the Ubuntu one with... Uh, uh, I improved their Docker file because they had just a million layers. They had layeritis going on, because and then they were also apt getting, apt updating, etc. <laughs> and then not cleaning up their temp files. So <laughs> it, it was definitely bloating their image quite a bit. Well, and I just copied and pasted a command from the internet and wondered why it didn't work. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. So there, there is a actually a, I didn't care that much. in the uh, uh, Slack channel there is a link to a gist where I wrote up uh, there there's a website out there called Oh Shit Git for when you uh, get yourself into a very deep hole of Git. Get yourself into a hole. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, the yeah, jokes they write themselves. But so anyway, though, this was uh, oh shit, Docker, it's sort of a, okay, so you're totally lost. Here's how you get back from the edge again. Uh, well, you can feel like oh shit, get. It's the same person who uh, Son of a get. <laughs> uh, did it. Uh, actually, it's very helpful when you get yourself into uh, Git Tar Hero uh, when you look at the subject <laughs> map. Because there, there's been a couple times that I've wandered myself into that where it, it looks like you have about a five uh, wide. Uh, yeah, my new coworkers uh, man did they script some rollbacks this last uh, spring. What a mess they made with that script. Also, as a uh, recommendation, if you can help it, don't force push. It only makes things worse. <laughs> oh, I force push. <laughs> are, you, uh, are you a replacer? Oh man. You're a zealot on the single single line of Git uh, history. I mean, I I heard a talk once where someone made the argument that in Git you should, if you make a mistake or there's a code bug and it fails compiling or something like that, you should actually uh, redo your history so that it shows your intent rather than what actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's also Ooh. a way different level of OCD that Ooh. I've never reached. Because <laughs> usually there's like four or five YOLOs in there and then a ASCII shrug. Yeah, <laughs> but that defeats the whole purpose of having a history. I, I can see where like, like, like something like squash could make sense. Because there's a lot of times where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, this is the commit to do the thing. And then I'm like, and then it's like, well, why did it fail on the build server? It worked on my machine. And then I'll be like, okay, this is the commit to do the thing again. Yeah. And it's like, you get 10 of those and you're like, I'm embarrassed. You I'm embarrassed to come back to the feature. Exactly. It needs to be part of the history. Just, just avoid any commit messages with the words finally or... Test <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. uh, have four. several. This <laughs> time I actually mean it. This time for reals. This time for real number two. Yeah. 
or, or, or one of the things that working under is I would just put dot dot, right? Kind of it was same thing as above. And you know, you'd see like a line of like 10 dot dots. Yeah. What you do is you add another dot for each time you're failing. <laughs> you see how long of a line, see if you can get the line to wrap before you've actually fixed it. Yeah, and then the, with the cloud formation stuff, that's when I finally go to the uh, cloud person and say, I don't know why it doesn't work. Hey, Alex, help. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, GitHub, uh, I don't know what that introduced to public GitHub, but GitHub Enterprise, that's the company that's at. You finally update the version, and it started to call out when you force push the branch. So, I used to, like, um, uh, uh, clean up the history, force push, like, when I open that PR, then I realized, no, shoot, then we have two more things, force push, okay. And then I would post it out to, like, my Slack channel and be like, all right, hey, guys, for real, uh, I got this, I'm a uh, PR here. <laughs> and someone noticed I had, like, get call, and it's like, Scott, force push this branch. And I'm like, hey, why are you force pushing? And I'm like, because I'm the only one on this branch, and I, you know, Squat all of the stuff anyway. Yeah, and I made my commit history nice, and I had to force push to do that. Like, it's even better that it was calling down on it. I do appreciate that. Yeah. For, for a uh, tool that some manager somewhere in my company made, that's used for about a period of two months. Uh, thankfully, that period is now over. <laughs> um, they put in a utility, it was really called Control Freak. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Uh, it does what it says on the tin, where we have URID integration, we have Slack integration with that, where to the point it, where if you have a single commit in your entire history that doesn't reference the URID ticket number, it would it would boot you out at the PR stage. I've heard about that. Yeah. The, the recommended solution was to, in fact, interactive amend all the way down your commit tree to get to that one commit that just omitted the the Jira ticket number, add it to the message, and then force push the whole thing back up. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right, where, he, where they sent out an email that said, "Is this working for you?" And I said, "Look, when you have to tell even a new developer, hey, you missed this commit message. By the way, dig down in this really hot repository." with all these other people's commits down to your commit, add the message, and then force push and hope that you didn't just kill somebody else's commit. <laughs> That's a bad tool just to keep a clean commit history. Yeah. So on, on, the, on the topic of automation uh, for Git that actually is nice, has anyone ever like you guys, how many people, like, is anyone else running to defend about on, on GitHub or like other places for you? It's, I've what seen a it great before. tool is that? What is it? It automatically scans if there's anything you have checked into source control that has a version of the software that's out of date or flags oh, any security oh, vulnerability, and then it'll automatically merge or automatically submit pull requests to you to say, hey, yeah. here's a vulnerability on this software dependency or this nice. policy of the software dependency that you depend on. And if you just take my uh, pull request, I will clean up all your your vulnerabilities for you. Yeah. And so like I've gotten I have like a couple of really dumb GitHub things. One is my color scheme for Visual Studio. And like my color scheme for Visual Studio had a freaking like three uh, vulnerabilities. <laughs> How dumb is that shit? But anyways, uh, like I found like three different like just randomly in my email, like you got a pull request. And I'm like, oh, who the heck pull request my thing? And it's like a machine. <laughs> what world do we live in now? I've not seen that all around um, the work room and the enterprise that I've come up and uh, we started to use a bot called Frontier or something. It does a similar thing. You can actually you add the bot as like a user to your org to go out and make uh, uh, PRs and extra stuff. And you can tell them, like, you know, only do minor version updates or only patch versions. And so yeah, all things like, oh, hey, this thing has a new minor version. There's a, set up your pipeline so I'm at the run to hold that branch and do a few tests of the security that way to simply patch my own version of the way.